Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome back to Eyes on Prophecy here on the WSLM Radio Ministry Podcast. I am your teacher, Pastor Vince, and I am so excited to be back with you once again. And we are going through our lesson. We've been going through our lesson over the past couple weeks entitled, Who is the Antichrist? We're going to continue through that lesson uh, today. Um, over the past couple weeks, we went, uh, we went over some very eye-opening material, I, and, and that's what I'll call it, eye-opening material. We looked at uh, nine different points that point to who the Antichrist is. Last week, I revealed to you who the Antichrist is according to the Bible, and we're going to continue moving forward from that point, from where we left off last week. So again, let me just go back really quick. I told you that a couple weeks ago, we looked at nine different points, uh, which clearly identify who the Antichrist is according to the Bible. And I feel like I need to keep emphasizing that the information that we're studying is according to the Bible. Last week, I revealed to you, according to the Bible, who the Antichrist is. And we learned that the Antichrist is the papacy. We went over some uh, some points to solidify that uh, the Bible is pointing to the papacy as the Antichrist. Uh, last week, we um, looked at uh, does the papacy fit these points. We learned that it came up among the ten kingdoms of Western Europe. It would have a man at its head who speaks for it, uh, and that is speaking of the Pope. Uh, three kingdoms were plucked up to make way for the rise of the papacy. It would be different from the other kingdoms, and it would make war with and persecute the saints. And I concluded last week's episode by saying that um, we are not attacking fellow Christians by identifying the little horn power. So please keep in mind that the prophecy is aimed at a system and not individuals. So we're talking about our Catholic friends. If you happen to be Catholic and you're listening to this episode today, or if you have been listening over the past couple of weeks or so, please understand, friend, that we are not attacking you as a uh, Christian. We are, we are not attacking you as a Catholic. We are looking at a system of belief that Satan is working through to attempt to carry out his agenda. So we understand that there are sincere, devout Christians in all churches, including the Catholic faith. And Daniel 7 is simply a message of judgment and correction upon a large religious institution, religious institution that compromised with paganism, as many other churches have done also, okay? Uh, I shared with you my background. I was not raised Catholic at home, but I went to Catholic school. I received a Catholic education from first grade all the way through 12th grade. I explained in last week's episode why that was. I invite you to go back and listen to last week's episode, which would be uh, part three of Who is the Antichrist? So with that being said, let's move forward with today's lesson. I want to begin with a word of prayer and get right into it. Loving Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together once again to study your word, to study this lesson, Who is the Antichrist? Thank you for what you have revealed to us. Help us to understand, help us to remember that this is from your word. We are not attacking anyone. We are just studying your word and allowing you to teach us what we need to know about uh, Bible prophecy, these last days, the end times and who Satan is using to work against you. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So friend, we are continuing our lesson entitled, Who is the Antichrist? We now know that the Bible points to the papacy as the Antichrist. Now, there are other prophecies which point out the faults of the Protestant and Jewish faiths. 
God has true people in all religions. Please understand, God has true people in all religions. His true people, no matter what their faith, will always humbly accept the correction of the Lord and will not shut their ears and hearts against him. We should be thankful that God's word speaks with impartial honesty on every subject. Now let us move forward in our lesson. Again, we're looking at, um, or we're trying to, to, to understand, does the papacy fit these points? I've already given you some of them already. Let's continue with these points. Now that we know that the papacy or the Bible points to the papacy as the Antichrist, we want to see, does the papacy fit these points? Again, I'll repeat what we've covered so far. It came up among the 10 kingdoms of Western Europe. It would have a man at its head who speaks for it. Three kingdoms were plucked up to make way for the rise of the papacy. It would be different from the other kingdoms. It would make war with and persecute the saints. The next one, it would emerge from the fourth kingdom of iron, which is the pagan Roman Empire. So I'm gonna cite two. Um, I'm gonna, gonna give you two quotes that support this particular point. The first quote says, "The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. The very capital of the old Roman Empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of uh, Pontifex Maximus." was continued in that of the Pope. And that comes from, uh, that's quoted from Alexander Clarence Flick, The Rise of the Medieval Church, pages 148 and 149. The second quote, whatever Roman elements the barbarians and Arians left came under the protection, under the protection of, the, of the Bishop of Rome who was the chief person there after the emperor's disappearance. The Roman church pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. And that quote comes from, let's see, where does that come from? It doesn't say here where, uh, where that particular quote, oh, yes it does. Adolf Harnack, what is Christianity? Pages 269-270. So again, the point we just looked at is it would emerge from the fourth kingdom of iron, uh, the pagan Roman Empire. The next point, God's people, meaning the saints, would be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So this is where a prophecy may for some start to get a little confusing, a little tricky maybe even a little intimidating because we're going to start getting into little math, I guess you could say. We're going you know, to start you know, looking at uh, prophetic time and how that, um, how that applies to the Bible. So prophetic time. And if you've been following me all along as we've been starting to study Bible prophecy, remember some time ago I went through all the different Bible symbols with you. Remember that? If you've been following along since way back then, each week for maybe a couple of weeks or so, we went through the you know, the different symbols in Bible prophecy. And I said that, OK, we're going to see these again in our lesson. We're going to see these again in the Bible itself. And we're going to see these terms in our lesson. So it was important to go through those terms to, um, you know, or a vocabulary, however you want to you know look at it to understand the symbols and Bible prophecy so that when they come up in the lesson, it'll make more sense to you. The words will make, or, or the symbols will make more sense and the lesson itself will make more sense. So, uh, prophetic time, a time equals one year. Times, T-I-M-E-S with an S on the end equals two years. Half a time is half a year. So again, the point is, God's people, the saints, would be given to, into his hand for a time and times and half a time. So uh, number one, under this point, a time is a year. 
as I've just said, a time is a year, times is two years, and half a time is half a year. The Amplified Bible translates it, uh, translate it as translates it as three and one half years. Number two, the same this same time period is mentioned seven times in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Again, just repeating what I've said before, that when we're studying Bible prophecy, we should study Daniel and Revelation, not just Revelation. Daniel and Revelation uh, go together. They complement each other when it comes to studying Bible prophecy. So again, number two, the same time period is mentioned seven times in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Uh, Daniel 7 and 25, as well as 12 and 7, Revelation 11, verses 2 and 3, Revelation 12 and 6, Revelation 14, and Revelation 13, verse 5. Three times as a time, times and half a time, twice as 42 months, and twice as 1,260 days. So based on the 30-day calendar used by the Jews, these time periods are all the same amount of time. Three and a half years equals 42 months, which equals 1,260 days. Number three, one prophetic day equals one literal year. The Bible says it in Ezekiel 4 and 6, Romans 14 and 34. Number four, thus the little horn, which is the Antichrist, was to have power over the saints for 1,260 prophetic days. That is 1,260 literal years. Because remember, in prophecy, a day equals a year. One day equals one year. Number five, the rule of the papacy began in A.D. 538, when the last of the three opposing Aryan kingdoms was uprooted. Remember, um, I think it was a couple weeks ago we went over, you know, the, the ten kingdoms. We said that three were uprooted, um, and I named those three that were uprooted. So according to this point here, or, 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 or to number five, the rule of the papacy began in A.D. 538 when the last of the three opposing Aryan kingdoms was uprooted. Its rule continued until 1798 when Napoleon's general, uh, Berthier, took the Pope captive with hopes of destroying both Pope Pius VI and the political power of the papacy. This period of time is an exact fulfillment of the 1,260-year prophecy. The blow was a deadly wound for the papacy, but that wound began to heal and continues healing today. Number six, this same period of persecution is mentioned in Matthew 24 and 21 as the worst period of persecution God's people experience. Verse 22 tells us, it was so devastating that not one soul would have survived if God had not shortened it. But God did shorten it. The persecution ended long before the Pope was taken captive in 1798. It is plain to see that this point, likewise, fits the papacy. So friend, I don't know if you um, have caught on to this or not, but history, world history, and the Bible go hand in hand. It is important that we understand how um, world history helps us to understand what God is teaching us. So uh, many of the events that have happened in the world throughout history, the Bible has an explanation for those events. Um, for example, why the true Sabbath day, God's true, uh, why God's true biblical Sabbath day, which is Saturday, was changed to Sunday by man. Man 
or a system changed God's Holy Sabbath day from Saturday to Sunday. And there's historical facts to back that up. So the Bible and history go hand in hand is what I'm trying to say. Let's move forward. The next point, it would speak pompous words of blasphemy against God. Blasphemy has two definitions in scripture. Number one, claiming to forgive sins, according to Luke 5 and 21. And number two, claiming to be God, according to John 10 and 33. So does this point fit the papacy? Yes. Let's first look at the evidence for it claiming to forgive sins, taking directly from its own literature. Quote, does the priest truly forgive the sins or does the or does he only declare that they are remitted? The priest does really and truly forgive the sins in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. And that's a quote. And that comes from um, a complete catechism of the Catholic religion from page 279 by Joseph uh, de Harb, uh, Joseph de Harb a complete catechism of the Catholic religion. That's where that quote comes from. The papacy further undermines Jesus by setting up a system of confession to an earthly priest, thus bypassing Jesus, Jesus, our high priest. Look at Hebrews 3 and 1, as well as Hebrews 8, 1 and 2, and only mediator. Look at 1 Timothy 2 and 5. Next, Ev uh, consider the evidence for it claiming to be God. Quote, we, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. End quote. That comes from Pope Leo the 13th encyclical letter, The Reunion of Christendom, dated June 20th, 1894. And that's where that particular quote comes from. Here's more evidence. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh. That quote comes from uh, Catholic National, July 1895. So it would speak pompous words of blasphemy against God. Number one, claiming to forgive sins. Look at Luke 5 and 21 claiming to be God, John 10 and 33. The next point, it would intend to change times and law. Now, in a future study guide, we're going to deal with the times of this point. It is a major topic and needs separate consideration. But what about changing law? What about that? The Amplified Bible translate law as the law. It translates law as the law. The reference is to changing God's law. Now, of course, no one can really change it, but has the papacy attempted to do so? The answer is yes. In its catechisms, the papacy has omitted the second commandment against veneration of images and has shortened the fourth commandment from 94 words to eight and divided the 10th commandment into two commandments. Now you can check for this yourself. Compare the Ten Commandments in any Catholic catechism with God's list of the commandments in Exodus 20, verses 2 through 17. So there is no doubt that the little horn power, known as the Antichrist of Daniel 7, is the papacy. No other organization fits all nine points. And incidentally, this is not a new teaching, friend. This is not something that we just came up with. This is something that's been taught for a very long time. So again, it's not a new teaching. Every Protestant reformer, without exception, spoke of the papacy as the Antichrist. And I'm going to recommend a book to you entitled The Great Controversy. I recommend you you know, you download the audio book, you know, you listen to the audio book, you buy the hard copy, but listen um, to uh, The Great Controversy um, and read it and you will learn about many different things. You'll learn about the reformers, 
of the past and how they spoke of the papacy as the Antichrist. Friend, we're going to stop right there. We're almost actually, actually, we're almost done with this lesson. We only have a little more to go, so we'll see what we're able to uh, to cover next week on next week's episode of Eyes on Prophecy. But I'm just looking through right now, and we don't have a lot more to cover. So I know this may have been a lot for you on this week's episode, but I hope you were taking notes. Of course, you can always go back. You can listen to what we covered today. And we're just, again, we're just unpacking this subject of who is the Antichrist. Now we know who the Antichrist is, and we're going through these different points to um, to solidify. And actually, we've we finished all the points which uh, solidify or confirm uh, that the papacy fits these points. All right. So again, I invite you to go back and uh, you know listen to this episode again if you've missed anything, if something's unclear to you. But yes, we're going to end this episode for this week. Let me close with a word of prayer. Loving Father, thank you so much for this study. Thank you for what you taught us today. Help us to continue studying for ourselves, to dig deeper into your word, because we know that there's so much more that we need to know, and this is not the end of our study. Continue to inspire us, to impress on our hearts, to continue to study your word and to dig deeper so that you can give us a better understanding of this material. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, thank you for joining me for another edition of Eyes on Prophecy here on the WSLM Radio Ministry Podcast. Tell others about this podcast. Please tell others about this program. Uh, This is one of our major programs here on the podcast. We also have another uh, major program entitled Prisoners of War. You may have listened to that already as well. We meet um, every Monday evening at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time for Prisoners of War. And um, yeah, so please uh, continue studying um, between now and the next time we come together. Um, And just continue praying that the Holy Spirit will will, uh, continue to lead you and guide you into all truth because this is Bible truth. This is not something that I made up that anyone else here at the ministry made up, that no other man has made up. This is straight from the Bible. And we want to uh, continue studying God's word because there's so much more that we need to know and understand. We're not leaning to our own understanding. We are letting the Bible interpret itself. We are letting the Bible speak for itself, which is what we should do. So, So please, Pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to continue to lead you and guide you to continue studying his word, to be diligently studying his word as the Bereans did back in the day during the early church days. So until we come together once again, by God's grace, be blessed. Have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath day. Have a great weekend. And may the Lord be with you. Please continue listening to the WSLM Radio Ministry the WSLM Radio Ministry Podcast where we stand for God's truth not man's traditions and we bring you straight Bible truth for these last days. The WSLM Radio Ministry Podcast is a virtual outreach ministry of Sacrificial Lamb Ministries. We are outreach driven. And before I go, I want to also let you know that you can find me On TikTok, I am now on TikTok, meaning that I have an account. I have a personal account on TikTok. Look for me under my, um, what do you call them, handle or whatever, at pastor.vince, at pastor.vince. You may be listening to this program today because you saw my video. You saw one of my videos on TikTok and there was a link there which invited you or which led you to this podcast. So, um, yes, you can find me on TikTok. Thank you so much for your support. Be blessed and take care.